All right. Welcome to our first lecture on photosynthesis. So I'd like to start this section with a quote from John Baptista von Helmont from 1648. I took an earthenware vessel and placed it in 200 pounds of soil, dried in an oven, soaked this with rainwater, and planted in it a willow branch weighing five pounds. At the end of five years, the tree had grown from it, weighed 169 pounds and about three ounces. Now the earthenware vessel was always moistened when necessary only with rainwater or distilled water, and it was large enough and embedded into the ground and left dust flying be mixed with the soil, an iron plate coated with tin and pierced by many holes covered the rim of the vessel. I did not compute the weight of the fallen leaves of the four autumns. Finally, I dried the soil in the vessel again, and the same 200 pounds were found, less about 2 ounces. Therefore, 169 pounds of wood, bark, and root had arisen from water only. So I find this quote very interesting because he thought then that the plant material came only from the water. So he missed the importance of the carbon dioxide in the air. But when you think about it and you look at plants and trees when you're outside, you know, think about all of that biomass is coming from the air and from water. That is pretty remarkable. You know, we can't do that. Our biomass comes from our food molecules. So in this lecture, we're really going to be looking at the process of photosynthesis or how plants can take carbon dioxide and convert it into sugar molecules. And they're doing this just with the energy of the sunlight. So the overall photosynthesis equation takes carbon dioxide, plus water, and then with the energy of sunlight, it's going to convert this into sugar, and oxygen is going to be the byproduct. So this is a little bit misleading because it looks like the water is being used to make the sugar, but it's not really. Only the carbon dioxide and protons that are coming from the system are used to create the sugar molecules. The water is really being used to generate the electrons in the system. The system needs to generate energy so that it can drive the production of the sugar molecules. And to do that, we need to make ATP during this process. And so we're going to use an electron transport chain very similar to what we saw inside the mitochondria. And so this electron transport chain requires the electrons. They're going to come from the molecules of water. And then the byproduct of that will be the oxygen. So to do this, plants contain a very unique organelle that's called the chloroplast. And the process of photosynthesis comes in two parts. So in the first part, you have the light reactions, where you're going to harvest the energy of the sunlight and use that to create ATP. So that's shown here in this diagram. So the energy is going to come in, electrons get harvested from the water molecules, oxygen is a byproduct in that reaction, and you're going to generate the electron transport chain here, and you're going to use an ATP synthase enzyme to produce ATP. The final acceptor of the electrons during this process is a molecule of oxidized NADP that gets reduced by those electrons to NADPH. The energy that's then created in this part of the system is going to get utilized in the Calvin cycle where carbon dioxide comes into the equation and you're using the molecules of carbon dioxide, you'll need six of them to create a six carbon sugar out at the other end. So I think plants are really cool because they can create their own food. So this slide shows a little bit more detail about plant structure. So in this upper figure, you're just getting the plant here. And then this is a cross section of one of these leaf structures. So you can see up here would be the top of the leaf. So looking down on it here. 
And then if we could look at the underside of the leaf, that would be down here on this bottom part. And then we've got the cross section, like we've cut it out and we're looking at the cells in between. So what you'll notice about the plants is that they've developed very broad leaves and this is going to be exposing that leaf surface to the sunlight. So it wants to have a large surface area to be able to collect that sunlight on the leaf surface. And it's going to do that with these little pigment molecules inside the chloroplast called chlorophyll. So in addition to having this broad area on top where the photons of light can hit on here and be absorbed, there also needs to be a way for gas exchange to occur. So that happens at these small little holes. They're usually located on the underside of the leaf on the bottom. And these are called stroma. And so the stroma is where the carbon dioxide can enter into the leaf structure. And then the oxygen that gets created inside during the photosynthetic process can also escape through the stomata. These stomata or stoma uh, are required for this gas exchange. So the other problem though, when you have the uh, stoma and that they're open or stomata, water can also come through this uh, spot as well. And that process is called transpiration. And so if you have a really hot day and it's very sunny outside, the leaves are gonna be heated up. They're gonna be collecting that sunlight, but they're also going to be transpiring and losing water. So sometimes on very hot days, the leaf will actually close the stoma or stomata and gas exchange won't be possible. And so in situations like this, where you may have some wilting of the plant, you're not going to get as good uh, photosynthesis occurring under that situation because you don't have the gas exchange allowing carbon dioxide in and the oxygen byproduct out. Okay, so this stomatal opening is regulated by these guard cells and the guard cells will sense the turgor pressure in the leaf. So if the plant really starts wilting and losing water, it's gonna lose that turgor pressure the guard cells are going to close the stomata opening and won't allow that gas exchange to occur. So these lower diagrams here are showing electron micrographs of the chloroplast structure. And so this is kind of a, a cross section along the chloroplast. And what you can see is that it has a lot of membrane structure on the inside of it, much more so than we saw with the mitochondria. It also still has a double bilayer. So you can kind of see that here. You've got this double bilayer forming. And then you have the internal space called the stoma in this case. And then you have more membranous structures. And if we look up close at these, they form kind of these stacked granular structures. This is called the granum. And they're made of stacks of what are called thylakoids. And so they look like, I don't know, a stack of pancakes uh, sitting up here. And so we're gonna see that the thylakoids, when they get stacked up like this, they're gonna be really critical for doing the light reactions of photosynthesis. So internal space inside each of these thylakoids that's stacked on top of each other is called the lumen of the thylakoid. And that's gonna be really important for generating proton gradients inside there to drive the production of ATP. Also similar to the mitochondria, it's thought that the chloroplast also originated in eukaryotic cells by being engulfed as a bacterium. And so we think this again because it has that double membrane and it also has its own genomic material, very similar to the mitochondria. And so you can see the full chloroplast genome from this plant here uh, is shown and it has 153,000 base pairs. You can see that a lot of the genes that are associated in here are genes that are utilized in the photosynthetic process. You've got photosystem one and two, the cytochrome B6F complex, which we'll see is also important in the electron transport chain, 
and other proteins that are utilized in the dark reactions in the Calvin cycle. So if we look at another cartoon diagram of the chloroplast, again, you can see it's got this double membrane suggesting that it was engulfed as a separate bacterial organism early during evolutionary history. It's got the inner membrane and the outer membrane, and in between would be the inner membrane space. So you can see that here. And then on the inside, you can see it's got a lot of this membranous structure. The thylakoids, again, as they get stacked up on each other, this is called the granum. And inside each one of these thylakoids is a thylakoid space known as the lumen. The stroma is the space inside the inner membrane but outside the thylakoids. So now we're going to take a little bit closer look at the properties of light before we really dive into the thylakoid and how the electron transport chain is actually working. So we know that the sun emits an enormous amount of electromagnetic radiation or solar energy or light energy. And so you need to recall that light can act as both a particle and a wave as it travels. And so if we're thinking about it as a wave, you can determine the wavelength by going from crest to crest or trough to trough, and you will get the full wavelength uh, distance. And if we think of the energy of light coming in as a particle, that particle or packet of energy is known as a photon of light. So there are many types of electromagnetic radiation. Um, you can see the full spectrum down here. You've got very, very long wavelengths that are radio waves that we can hear. We have the full visible spectrum, the infrared area, the UV or ultraviolet area, and then as we keep getting shorter in our wavelengths, that's where we're going to generate X-rays and then gamma rays, which are much more reactive and damaging. So these short waves are going to carry the most energy, and then the longer waves will carry less energy with them. So our pigment molecules that are found inside the chloroplast, such as chlorophyll and the carotenoids, can absorb and reflect light within specific regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And these are going to occur within the visible range. So the visible spectrum extends from 380 nanometers up through 700 nanometers. Lower than this, you get into the ultraviolet, and we can't visibly see that. And then above the red, we get into the infrared. We also cannot see above the red range. So for the biological activity of the chloroplast, the chloroplast is also utilizing light within this visible range. Note that the violet has the shortest wavelength and that the red has the longest wavelength. So the light energy that's coming into the plant is harvested by pigments. And these different kind of pigments exist, which have evolved to absorb only certain wavelengths or colors of visible light. And the pigments are going to reflect or transmit the wavelengths that they cannot absorb, making them appear that corresponding color. So chlorophylls, for example, that's shown here, the chlorophyll A, shows up as a very green molecule. And that's because it cannot absorb the wavelengths in the green spectral range. It reflects those back out, and that's why that green color appears. So it can absorb light in the other wavelengths in the visible spectrum, specifically within the blue range, and it has another peak in the red range. So it can absorb the light because it has all of these double bonds. So molecules that have alternating double and single bonds, so you can see double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond. These are called polyenes. So they're polyunsaturated organic compounds that contain at least three alternating double and single carbon-carbon bonds. So these alternating bonds can interact in a process known as conjugation, and they result in some unusual optic properties. 
So the chlorophylls and the carotenoids are our two major classes of photosynthetic pigments that are found in plants and algae, and they are also these polyene structures. Each class has multiple types of pigment molecules. There's five major chlorophylls. Chlorophyll A is shown here, but there's chlorophylls B, C, and D as well, and along with other related molecules that are found in prokaryotes called the bacteriochlorophylls. Carotenoids are another common polyene that are found uh, within chloroplast structures. These pigments produce bright yellow, red, and orange colors. Uh, they're often found in plant vegetables, so carotenoids are very high in things like carrots and squash, and they act as a type of antioxidant in humans, and that's due to their polyene structure. So there's more than 600 different types of carotenoids, and they also play a functional role in harvesting light from the sunlight during the process of photosynthesis. So this is a nice diagram over here that shows the spectral regions where light can be absorbed the most with some of the different major pigment molecules inside the chloroplast. So it's showing chlorophyll A and B here. So this is chlorophyll A. And you can see that it is going to absorb the most in this blue range right before you get into that green area. The green, it, it can't absorb very well at all, and that's where the color comes from. And then there's another area over here in the red range where it can also absorb light. And you can see that the other uh, harvesting molecules here, the chlorophyll B and the carotenoids, they have a little bit different range. You can see for the carotenoids that it can absorb in the green range, but then it doesn't down here in this yellow and orange range, and that's why those have those typical colors associated with the carotenoids. So what's happening then when the energy from the sunlight comes into a light harvesting pigment? So it can be turned into chemical energy. As the photon of light enters into a, an atom, uh, what it does is it actually is going to be absorbed by the electron, and it's going to bounce the electron up in the orbitals inside the atom. So when they go up to the higher shell, they have to release energy for the electron to come back down and fall back down. And when it releases, it usually will emit light. However, if you have a lot of energy coming in from a photon of light, you can actually pop the electron off of the atom. And that's what's going to end up happening in the photosynthesis process. The electron will get excited enough and collect enough energy to actually pop it out of its orbit and capture it. And it's going to uh, get captured inside the chlorophyll molecule and be transported to a molecule of plastoquinone. So in the next lecture then, we'll take a look at how the chloroplast is actually doing that to actually utilize the energy from the sunlight to harvest those electrons.